Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I've said so little because I really did not want to cannibalise what I'm going to say, which is, in terms of content, at least very, very small. That will take a long time, probably, to <laughs> elaborate. But, but, um, so look, yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, had a, I set up a sustainability company that got bought by PwC in what I came to understand was slightly more of an acquisition than a full-scale merger between our organisations. <laughs> and before that, I was at the World Bank, uh, done a bit of writing, and then the future-proofing stuff is trying to look at the big stuff coming down the tracks to see whether we've got the rights to optimism. Are we going to navigate our way through it? Um, I don't know about you, I'm really depressed about what's going on with this, this <laughs> Syria business. I'm, 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 I'm deeply depressed um, about it and about, about our, our, responses, our responses. But what I'd love to do is throw out some stuff in relation to this um, question, playing with a couple of the comments that have come in. So, okay. Time and space and the challenges we've got. I want to, like Jeremy, throw out a, a quote to begin with from a, a philosopher, which is Marilyn Monroe. Okay? <laughs> and she says this great thing, which is, sometimes good things fall apart because better things are going to fall into place. And it could be that we're on, you've all done your economics, you've heard of Minsky moments. We're at not a Minsky moment, but a, 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 a Monroe moment, a Marilyn moment, where something clearly is starting to fall apart. That half of the equation we know is happening. And the question is, is the better thing going to fall into place? So what's, you know, we've lived in the city of Henry Ford. That was the 20th century. It was the car-shaped city, a city shaped by the general purpose technology of fossil fuel driven mass production, which kicked butt, which raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We know that. But over time, it, of course, started to develop some side effects. And we have seen these pathologies. And of course, we've seen mass production shifting jobs off to low labor cost centers. So we've been left in the UK with broken, bankrupt, jobless, debt-driven, cheap money-driven communities. We've, of course, seen that economic and social pathologies of that. We've seen the carbon pathology. And we know that it's not just the parts per million that we're seeing. It's the 200,000 people a day fleeing the broken countryside for the cities. And if you look at Syria, you know, we know that there's been five years of drought from 2006 to 2011 that helped to shift 1.5 million people in northeastern Syria, the breadbasket of Syria, to the towns, which, of course, did not cause the conflict, but it did not help. And it has not helped in other parts of the Middle East. And it doesn't look like it's going to help. We were just hearing from Rob Hope in terms of water security and the political risk around that. And if you just play this stuff together, you know, what you start to see is we're going to be living in a world where there are going to be 4.9 billion people, this is the estimate, in African and Asian megacities by 2035. And a lot of them are going to be young, and they're going to be poor, and they're going to be jobless, and they're going to be living in territories where there is scarcity of water and where crops are failing. And it's just not clear how you deal with that. And of course, we have a current model, which is you wait for that urbanization to happen, then as the big city, the mega city crumbles, the petropolis crumbles of Nairobi, of Lagos, of Joburg, what you do is you build the smart city. You build the barrio cerrado, the gated community with 12 meter high electronic fences in which the businesses can protect themselves. And of course, the UK is in danger of becoming one giant barrio cerrado with borders that are impenetrable to those who do not have the wealth to buy their way in. And that's a possible scenario for the future. And you can see that in terms of the carbon challenge of that, just dealing with that, I'm involved with a magnificently turgid um, report on this that really tries to crunch through the numbers on are we actually decarbonizing? This is called the Low Carbon Economy Index. It's actually, it really tries to whack through the numbers. And the current rate that we've got to decarbonize or improve the carbon intensity each year is 6.3%. We've never really done more than about four globally ever. But it has to be 6.3% a year from now to the end of the century on our current run rate. By the way, if we meet all our Paris commitments at COP21, you know what percent we'd decarbonize? Three. We'd improve by 3%. So we have to double the hoped for Paris commitments to get on track for two degrees. If we don't start doing that, by the way, beyond about 2020, in terms of the time dimension, the cost of decarbonization tend up towards the limit. 
it turns up towards the amount. It's okay. So you can see that in terms of the space of the megacities, in terms of the time of that challenge, the stuff that makes you kind of scratch your head a bit. But I would also flip that around, because I can see that if you just look at the economic dimension of it and the technological revolutions angle, there's real currents that give you optimism. So if you look at energy with all due, you know, whatevers, for, 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 for Jeremy, um, <laughs> respects and the things for Jeremy. Um, you know, we, th this is another, this is going to be the most boring bit of what I say, but if you look at the energy returns on energy invested, he, has anyone heard about the EROEI of oil? hundred years ago when Ford was, you know, using mass production to get oil out of the ground and harness its magic power, um, the EROEI, 100 to 1, just put your finger in the ground, bam, it came out, it's brilliant. Now, with, ta with fracking, with tar sands, with shale, with subsoil, it takes a lot of work and a lot of en clever engineering, but a lot of work, a lot of gas, a lot of cost to get it out. Your EROEIs have been going on a terminal nosedive. They're in the sort of 4 to 15 bandwidth around about now, and the break-even's around about 12. So what you don't have is a resource that's suddenly giving a massive uh, boost to productivity. So if that's one megatrend, there's this flip side, which is renewables, partly because of uh, the Chinese, the great heroes in this, um, have become really low cost. And they are going to be not just a really low cost, but a really low cost, zero marginal cost technology, where once you've got it in the, in the, in the, in the roof, wherever it's going to be on the roads, it's just printing out your free, abundant electricity. And of course, VW, another hero in this debate, will accelerate that. And you've already got Tesla's, you know, power wall and the batteries giving more than 60 days off-grid um, battery storage for a US household. And if just one in 10 switch to the from the fossil fuel grid to batteries, the economics of the centralized, lossy, inefficient, 40-year-old, antiquated, coal-powered grid, that was a lot of adjectives, I know, piled up in one go, but the economics of that grid basically start to crumble. And the moment it crumbles, frankly, it's going to accelerate again the shift towards renewal. So you could see that there are huge grounds if you just look at the technology for optimism. But then I give you another quote from this Microsoft guy called a Kentaro, Toy a Kentaro Toyama, a former Microsoft research director who says technology is not the answer, it is the amplifier of intent. And the real challenge for me <coughs> seems to be the challenge of intent. Who do I think is the real enemy of business sustainability? And I get back, Matthew, to your great question. I know I'm sounding a bit like Nick Clegg, really doing the name checking and stuff here. But it gets back, Matthew, to your excellent question on, um, on you know, what's the business model? Because for me, at least, and I don't know if anyone agrees on this, uh, economics is a subset of philosophy. Economics and business models reflect a decision about what is the good life. What is it that we are solving for? What is the flourishing society? And it gets back to your question at the back that I almost wanted to answer, but it was, I knew I was going to really bl like blow my material if I answered it then. Um, businesses and VW... What is the function of a business? If you go back to the history of the corporation, what were the first corporations? They were doing prodigious things. They were mining out the critical resources people were going to survive on. They were building the railroads. The Pope was a corporation. The church was a corporation. You got a corporation status, and you got all the benefits that it gave you in terms of massive tax breaks, legal liabilities, longevity, the ability to transmit leadership across people over time, the ability to raise cash, to deliver your societally valuable enterprise. You got all that because you were doing something useful. You got all that because you were solving a problem. You got all that because you were built up as a corporation on the assumption, on the precept, that your business was interdependent with the world around it. Exactly what Jeremy said, that a business is only as healthy as the society around it is healthy. There are no jobs on a broken planet. The business was, and if we are going to have a hope, will still be there because it is solving a problem. A problem that is essential to creating a society that's actually going to work. So if you ask me, what is the real challenge? The real challenge is a philosophical decision about what is the good life. And it's one 
where I think there's a subtle shift that's going to be necessary. For all that the technology can help us, I think there is a bigger shoe that's going to have to drop, which is the philosophical shoe about our decision about the good life. What is a corporation for and what are we for? Let me give you Ruskin, the guy who turned Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, into Gandhi in Gandhi's own writing was John Ruskin, who just asked this question, um, you know, what is the nature of wealth? And Ruskin's answer is, it's this, there is no wealth but life. That in the end, that is the thing that creates the well-being. What creates the well-being for us is not what we've had, the century of the self, where we're living in this neoclassical ideology that it is consumption for us alone that creates utility. And that is what we must maximize. What we know, and this is Amos Setzioni again, with his I, we paradigm, is that is not what constitutes the good life for us. If you look at all our lives in practice, we know that it is not that model of consumption for the sake of consumption that creates our well-being. It just ain't. And yet we allow ourselves to be educated and guided and led politically by leaders who act as though that is the sole thing. And the reality, I believe, is that it is through that independence amongst us and between us and our ecosystem that we know it's going to work. That is a philosophical choice that, if we get it right, will prove to be an enormous ally, that relationship with each other and with the ecosystem. And on that note, any of you who are still conscious, I'll stop. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.